The Core P90TG from Thermaltake features a unique prism-shaped open-air design so you can ogle your parts from any angle. The 5mm tempered glass keeps things classy, and the three-chamber design supports a full complement of hardware even if you're custom water cooling. For more on the Core P90TG, click the sponsor link in the description. Well guys, Ryzen 2 has launched. This is my initial benchmarking video for it, so thank you so much for stopping by to check this video out. And of course, if you enjoy it, don't forget to hit the thumbs up button on your way out before you leave. Today, there are four new CPUs available for purchase. You can see them all here. You've got the eight core 16 thread 2700X and 2700, as well as the six core 12 thread 2600 and 2600X. Now, all these CPUs are unlocked for overclocking, just like first gen Ryzen, and they all come with CPU coolers. Uh, the Wraith Spy for most of them or the new Wraith Prism with RGB lights and actual heat pipes on it if you're going to shell out $330 for the 2700X. These are all also based on the Zen Plus architecture, which is a refinement of the original Zen architecture from last year. It's manufactured on the Global Foundry's 12 nanometer process. The result is CPUs that can run at higher frequencies, about 250 megahertz faster across the board, with reduced cache latencies while still remaining backwards compatible with existing socket AM4 motherboards. Although older 300 series motherboards might need a UEFI update before they accept new 2000 series CPUs, uh, so make sure that whatever board you choose, if you're getting a 300 series, says AMD Ryzen Desktop 2000 Ready on it. And that should at least provide you boot support with these new 2000 series processors so you can get the board up and running and then run the BIOS update. Or if you're setting up a new system and buying parts, 400 series boards with the X470 chipset are now available. X470 boards will have the best high-end overclocking for chips like the 2600X and 2700X, and they'll also let you use Store MI, which is AMD's new SSD caching solution. It's actually pretty flexible since you can set it up and remove it after you've installed Windows, and it integrates a DDR4 caching layer as well, but I'm gonna have to cover that in more detail in a separate video. For now though, let's take a look at my testing setup. I'm gonna be comparing the 2700X and 2600X to the first gen Ryzen 1600X and 1800X, and I'll also include Intel's six core 12 thread 8700K to see how Team Blue's top mainstream chip stacks up. All the CPUs are running at stock frequencies with Turbo Boost or Precision Boost enabled. I set up the test bed on the new ASUS Crosshair 7 Hero. Uh, this is the successor to the Crosshair 6 Hero that I used, which is the X370 motherboard. This has the X470 chipset, and I've updated it with the latest BIOS version provided by ASUS, which is version 0508, uh, which was launched on April 13th. For the memory, I have enabled XMP mode. Uh, with ASUS, they call it DOCP, but I enabled the XMP profile for DDR4 3200, cast latency 1414, 1434 at 1 1.35 volts. I also wanted to turn off anything that might be extra there in the BIOS settings to make sure that I was just getting stock performance like most people could expect with the 2700X or 2600X out of the box with any motherboard. So performance enhancer is set to default, performance bias is set to none, and core performance boost is enabled to make sure that we can get that precision boost 2.0. The memory kit is a G-Skill Trident Z RGB DDR4 kit. Uh, it's a two by eight gig kit, DDR4 3200 cast latency 14. My storage drive is a Samsung 960 Pro 500 and 12 gig NVMe SSD, and the power supply is an EVGA 750 watt G3. Finally, for a graphics card, across all the tests, we're using an ASUS GTX 1080 Ti Strix with NVIDIA 391.35 drivers. My first test is a tried and true Cinebench benchmark. In multi-threaded performance mode, we can see the eight cores and 16 threads really taking off with a total score of 1789 for the 2700X and 1358 for the 2600X. Here you'll see a trend that continues throughout my testing, which is the 2700X winning when multi-core is a factor. The 2600X coming up pretty close in some situations to the 1800X, but of course beating out the 1600X in all scenarios. The 2700X does seem to consistently beat the 8700K, but more on that as we move on. Cinebench single thread is an important test because it shows the single threaded performance advantage that Intel still has with the 8700K with a score of 203. The 2700X is increasing its single threaded performance with a score of 178 as compared to last generation's 160. Moving on to CPU mark, overall score here is 17,693 for the 2700X and just over 15,000 for the 2600X. That's over a 1,000 point jump going from the 1600X to the 2600X. So nice to know that even folks who are being a little bit more on the budget side with a $230 range CPU are still getting a nice performance boost. CPU Mark single thread shows similar performance differences to Cinebench single thread with again the 8700K coming out on top with a score of 2717. 
Moving on to Blender, this is the Splash Fishy Cat render, and here we can see all the times within the 30 second range. The 2700X does manage to break into the sub 30 seconds with a 29.8 second score. Faster is better here, of course, and we can see the other chips falling in line as expected compared to the Cinebench tests. Here's the BMW 27 render, also using Blender, and again we can see that the 2700X with all of its cores and threads uh, beats out all the competition with a time of 265 seconds. The 8700K was previously neck and neck with the 1800X with only a six second differential, but with the updated Zen Plus architecture, we can see the 2700X pulling away. Moving on to 3D Mark Firestrike Ultra, we have overall graphics and physics results here. Bear in mind the graphics is all testing the same graphics card, but we can see slight variations depending on the CPU that it's paired up with. The physics score is probably what you want to pay attention to here, and again the 2700X wins with a score of 21,140. Here's 3D Mark Time Spy, similar to Fire Strike Ultra, but we're talking DirectX 12 now instead of DirectX 11. Again, we have overall graphics and CPU scores, and once again, we can see the 2700X just dominating the CPU score with 8901. Moving on to some game testing, here is Rise of the Tomb Raider, DirectX 12 mode, we're testing Geothermal Valley, and we're doing all these tests at 1920 by 1080 because that will show more difference in performance when it comes to the CPU, as opposed to just testing what the graphics card can do. Of course, some games are tuned differently than others, but with Rise of the Tomb Raider, we can see a variance here. The 8700K should give us the best performance out of the 1080 Ti, if CPU is a factor at all, and here we can see that play out with the average frame rate of 159.5 seconds, where as our Ryzen CPUs are coming in a good 20 to 30 FPS below that. Now in this test, it was the most exaggerated, but as we move on, we can see that that is not always the case. Total War Warhammer 2, for example, shows pretty much zero variation between any of the CPUs I tested. This means that we are GPU limited rather than CPU limited. The CPU is not holding the graphics card back at all. This is what the graphics card is capable of putting out at 1920 by 1080. 115 frames per second across the board. Moving over to Grand Theft Auto 5, and here again we can see some variation between the CPUs. The best frame rate was 164 FPS with the 8700K, but uh, we did get respectable frame rates beyond that in the 130 and low 140 frames per second range with the Ryzen-based CPUs. So there's a drop off in performance there, but this again is at 1080. If you were to increase the resolution to uh, 2560 by 1440 or 4K, you'd see those numbers even out. So we're really testing at the lower resolution just to show the difference. Speaking of difference or lack thereof, Overwatch at 1920 by 1080 is pretty much hitting the 300 frames per second cap with a uh, GTX 1080 Ti. So all the results are just shy of that. And I probably didn't even need to run this test, but it's there, so there you go. Play all the Overwatch you want with the 1080 Ti. And finally, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, which is known to suffer some, from some optimization issues. So here again, we can see some difference in frame rates with the 8700K coming out on top with 154 frames per second, but the 2700X and 2600X definitely catching up compared to last generation uh, with scores of 142 and 124 frames per second respectively. Next to some power draw comparisons, I'm testing the total system power draw as measured from the wall. So not just the CPU, but also the graphics card and everything included as well. I'm testing average and peak power draw while running the 3D Mark Firestrike Ultra combined test. And then of course idle once the system has been sitting still for about a half an hour with nothing going on to make sure it's completely idle. Uh, it does seem like the idle numbers have improved a little bit, so only 61, 50, 59 uh, watts of power drawn uh, when at idle. So that's a little bit better than we saw with the X370 motherboard, so maybe um, some power efficiency improvements with X470. That's just speculation. I don't actually know what caused that difference. Uh, but when it comes to average power draw, we're seeing a bit of an increase, but not significant. The 2700X did draw the most power, 385 watts on average with a peak at 414, and just about a 10 watt drop off for the 2600X, and all of this is still within the same general range as the 1800X and 1600X. The 8700K has the lowest listed average power draw here, but bear in mind that is a six core processor, and it is, at least in the case of the 1800X and 2700X, being compared to eight core processors. Let's move on to temperatures though, and I did decide to use the Wraith Prism Cooler for both of the CPUs, the 2700X and 2600X, so bear that in mind when I'm comparing these temperatures. Zen Plus is actually more efficient than the original Zen. For example, AMD tested at 3.5 GHz fixed frequency and found it drew 11% less power, but since they also increased the clock speeds, the TDP actually
actually went up from 95 watts on the 1800X to 105 watts for the 2700X. In my Ida64 stress test after a 15 minute run, both CPUs were topping out just shy of 90 degrees Celsius. Voltages were peaking at about 1.4 to 1.5 volts even, but those were just peak numbers. As it was running, it was actually at about 1.3 volts on average. I also wanna point out that when you're looking at the Ida64 temperature chart here, you can see little peaks. So the temperature rises, gets up near 90 degrees, and then the CPU frequency throttles back just a little bit in order to account for that higher temperature. Temperature drops back down towards 80, and the cycle continues. The upshot and what we're looking at here with the 2700X is a frequency of about four gigahertz across all cores when it's under a stress test load like this, but we see that drop off to about 3.95 or even 3.9 gigahertz as temperatures ramp up. Thanks to the way Precision Boost 2 works, however, it's able to ramp down that clock speed more slowly and that maintains a higher frequency for a little bit more of the time, so you're not going to see as much performance drop off as you might have with Precision Boost 1.0. Here in my screen cap, you can also see the new Ryzen Master 1.3 software. It has been updated with some new features like showing the motherboard socket power and sustained VRM capacity, as well as a little gold star on your fastest core. Uh, it also gives you a little silver star on your second fastest core, and then a couple silver circles indicating the cores on your fastest CCX unit on the CPU. The chips are binned at the factory, according to AMD, and these values as far as what the fastest core is are actually hard-coded for each processor. Now, I'm not covering overclocking today, but I did at least want to mention it since all of these CPUs are unlocked for overclocking. Similar to last generation, you could save $30 and go with the non-X CPU like a 2600 for $199 versus the 2600X for uh, $230. Overclock it and get yourself pretty close to that 2600X performance. That said, I only did some brief overclocking with the CPUs and there doesn't seem to be a ton of overclocking headroom. It is there, but it's pretty minimal, again, similar to the first generation Ryzen. You should expect four gigahertz across all cores, um, whether you're talking about the six core or the eight core. It seems to be achievable without overclocking, uh, although it will ramp off the uh, speed a little bit depending on the temperatures and the cooling solution that you're using. 4.1 or 4.2 gigahertz on all cores seems to be a fairly reasonable expectation if you're manually overclocking, depending on your processor and your motherboard, of course, and potentially 4.3 gigahertz or even 4.4 gigahertz on all cores might happen, but that's gonna be more challenging, more of a stretch goal. Uh, you're gonna have to play the silicon lottery a little bit, and you're probably gonna need to go with high-end air or liquid cooling in order to maintain those higher frequencies. So guys, that pretty much covers it for my introductory benchmarks for Ryzen 2 CPUs, the 2700X and 2600X, both tested today, and I'm pretty impressed. Obviously, this isn't like a massive sea change in performance. They weren't promising this is a brand new architecture or anything like that, but since we also have backwards compatibility with AM4 motherboards and existing B350 and X370 chipsets, uh, it's not too bad. It means you could take, for example, like in my video I did on my $500 build earlier this year, a system that you built for relatively little money and upgrade it from like a quad core with no simultaneous multi-threading to an eight core 16 thread CPU. I mean, it's a pretty massive shift in performance and it's really cool that you can get such a wide range of processors on a single platform. I don't even mind the fact that they have new motherboards that are X470. There's a few extra features that you get there, but nothing that would make B350 or X370 motherboard users feel like, wow, I really need to upgrade for this new stuff. There's a couple new things there and I'll hopefully check out StoreMI in the future. But for now, I'd like to hear what you guys think about this new product launch. So let me know down in the video's description uh, what you think of the new processors, if you think the performance is up to snuff, and if you're considering a build based on the new platform or the 2700X or 2700 or 2600X or 2600 even. And of course, don't forget to hit the thumbs up button on your way out if you enjoyed this video. Thank you guys so much for watching and we'll see you next time.